Welcome to the Times of Industry show. With everything that's going on, I welcome a guest that's very familiar to people uh, that follow the gold space, the gold price suppression shenanigans, and the silver uh, price manipulation, everything like that. He knows a thing or two about the COMAX, uh, the leading investment banks, JPM, HSBC, Barclays, to name a few. Um, and those who, who follow closely the gold-silver ratio and everything like that, Ted Butler is my guest today, a first-time guest, actually. I'm very excited to fire away questions at a person that I have much respect for. And thanks uh, for being here, Ted. Oh, thank you. It's, um, it's my pleasure. I, I want to ask you, first of all, for people who do know you and, and just people that in, in general that, that uh, may, may have not heard the name before somehow uh, and are maybe new to the space, how did your passion and interest uh, for precious metals, specifically silver, begin? And why has it become such an important part of your life? I mean, many people... Uh, think of silver as wow this is this is money this is, i need to own some precious metals etc you made it a career uh why uh, tell us a little bit about the special fascination and and uh, uh passion with precious metals when how did it start uh well it's a it's a very timely uh, uh question uh because um just uh, yesterday um i found out that the uh, individual that uh sparked uh, my interest in silver going back 35 years uh, or so. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Israel Friedman uh, had passed away. Uh, he was the, uh, the spark, the genesis of uh, my interest in, uh, in silver. And I, I may he rest in peace and I'm going to miss him dearly because uh, he was in my thoughts uh, every single day without exaggeration. Anyway, I, I was a broker um, at uh, Drexel Burnham in Miami. Uh, Izzy, Izzy Friedman, uh, was a client of the office, not my client at the time, but a client of the office. And he knew I got involved in, uh, and when I got involved in commodities, I got involved very uh, deeply. and. Uh, it was a long-term campaigns, things like that. I, I, I wasn't a day trader, I was a big position trader. And uh, after I had finished a position uh, trade, uh, looking for the next thing to do, Izzy uh, challenged me um, to figure out why silver was so cheap. This is uh, going back to 1985 or so, after the Hunt brothers run to $50 and were back down to $5. Why silver was so cheap when um, we were using more of it than uh, we were producing? It was a deficit consumption pattern. And the son of a gun uh, set off a spark in my, uh, in my mind because I couldn't come up with the answer. Couldn't answer how could a price not go up when we're using more of it than we're producing and inventories are shrinking dramatically. It took me a year to figure out the answer, and the answer then and now for why silver is so cheap is because there was concerted and concentrated short selling on the big COMEX derivatives paper market. Um, and that kept the price down. And uh, it still keeps the price down, even though we've gone up uh, over the years from, from time to time. So anyway, this is basically um, uh, a manipulation. It was an artificial price constraint that has existed for the last three and a half decades with brief interruptions. And because it's against the law and um, you know uh, beyond immoral, um, it revved me up. It said, this is not right. And... Uh, I've done everything I could think of uh, since then, petitioning the exchange, petitioning the regulators, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, <laughs> petitioning the Justice Department, commissioning, commissioning, uh, petitioning uh, governors and senators and silver producing states. And it's just, uh, uh, it hasn't been successful in that it's not, the authorities haven't taken any action yet, but it has been successful in that more people than ever recognize what's going on. 
and the uh, the guy that started it all, who unfortunately just passed away, Izzy Friedman, um, he was the spark of the whole thing. And uh, you know, way these things turn out, it uh, he, he might uh, be proven, you know, a hundred percent correct if we do get uh, an explosion in price in the near term. Um, unfortunately, after he's no longer with us. It's a very interesting story. And you know, um, what, how old are you when you uh, started looking at this? Uh, I was uh, under I was in my late 30s, 36, 37. I'm uh, 72 today, so it's, it's been a while. Um, and it, not that it hasn't been rewarding. There have been uh, you know, many spikes up in price. But uh, not to the extent of the spike that I think uh, is coming. Interesting. Yeah, you know, uh, it, it's it always makes me wonder um, how people can prefer uh, to say that uh, gold is, is uh, has been a, a bad investment. Even <coughs> Warren Buffett. I mean, to go from thirty five an ounce to um, nearly sixteen hundred today, it. it it's performed better than the S and P 500 in the uh, fiat monetary system. So I, I definitely think that for people that are uh, talking about uh, the manipulation of gold uh, and silver prices, it's an amazing um, thought to consider that without uh, price uh, suppression, at least on the central bank side and, and uh, many other ways that uh, it's being done, what would the real price be today? And, and that's kind of when I want to poke your, uh, your brains about how deep does the rabbit hole go with uh, paper contracts and manipulation? Obviously, the, the only reason to start a leveraged paper contract market is to create some sort of a manipulation scheme, um, whether or not it's, it's conspiratorial or uh, just every actor is acting alone is, is another issue. But can you talk a little bit about evidence that you've seen over the years and stuff that you've seen, uh, instances that are carved in your mind, like burned in your mind that you, you can't get rid of uh, about saying, man, this, this was uh, criminal, this was illegal, et cetera? Oh, well, there, there are a few. One that, that stands out is the, uh, the, the, the occurrence of the, uh, the events that transpired after we ran up in, uh, in April of 2011 to near $50 in, uh, in silver, um, how the market was uh, uh, crushed, you know, uh, came down like uh, uh, $20 or more in a very short period of time. That stands out as a, uh, a highly uh, manipulative uh, time in the market. Um, but just to give, you know, just to be fair about the whole thing, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, the futures market, that's my background. Uh, I started out at Merrill Lynch as a commodity broker in the early 1970s, 70, 70, 71, something like that. And um, I, I have, a, I'm a student of the markets. I think the markets serve a, a good function. The, the problem is, is that, uh, you know, there's bad players in everything. And uh, for some reason, they have uh, gravitated towards silver and gold um, more so than, uh, than other markets. And uh, I think we're in the, in the process now of uh, resolving something that should have been resolved a long time ago. In, in essence, what it comes down to is that there are just a handful, no more than eight or ten very big paper traders in gold and silver, mostly banks uh, led by JP Morgan and, and then typical names like that, HSBC, et cetera, um, that have a uh, tremendous um, short position uh, for, for no good reason, no legitimate reason. They have just taken the other side of the market. They, they function as market makers. They, they, they do it mostly in the metals, mostly in gold and silver, and not in other commodities like corn or oil uh, or even copper. Um, they, uh, for some reason, I guess they feel somebody has to be short if somebody wants to go long, which mathematically has to be the case. But it just 
doesn't have to be them. They uh, basically um, have cornered the short side of the market and have sold so many um, short contracts um, that that is what that concentrated selling is what's kept the uh, the price down, and that's where the manipulation lies. The problem is that they've always been able to get away with it, and that eventually they sell enough contracts short to uh, satisfy the market, all the buying out there, and then when that happens, the the price comes down because many people who trade the market are technical people, momentum type traders, and after they buy a tremendous, uh, put on a tremendous long position, they buy these technical traders. It, once they, they're they done with it, they, they, they turn around and sell, and this has just been the, the ebb and flow, the wash, rinse, repeat cycle of the market that these big shorts have always gained from. However, this time, over the last three months or so, with this rally that we've had in gold and silver, mostly gold, mostly been a gold rally, um, the number of short positions have, have increased dramatically. We're at record short levels for all intents and purposes in gold right now. And uh, these guys are hurting. Uh, they're, they're, they're deep in the hole, these seven or eight big shorts. Um, uh, I'll exclude J.P. Morgan because J.P. Morgan did something very smart about eight years ago. They started buying up tremendous quantities of physical gold and silver, and they own more gold and silver now than any private entity has ever done in the history of the world. Um, so they're okay. J.P. Morgan is not going to get hurt. Ted. Um, before yes. you before you go on on this point on, on the J.P. Morgan uh, physical uh, gold and silver position, where is it reported on on their uh, balance sheet, on their quarter? It's rate? not. It's not reported. They have a an army, okay, of lawyers and accountants and and lobbyists, okay. That they you won't find anything on their balance sheet that they don't want you to find. So you won't find this at all. You have to find it uncovered in different ways. Uh, either in COMEX warehouses or uh, sales of uh, Silver Eagles over the last, uh, you know, from, from 2011, 2016. There's so also different things you have to look at, but you won't find it on their books. Interesting. So if, if I am a shareholder of JP Morgan, I go to the annual meeting, I raise my hand, I say, we're, we're uh, you know, I, I own presumably uh, a lot of physical gold and silver. What can you tell me about it? They will say, the, the CEO will say nothing? Well, you won't get to ask the question. So until you're making a, a, an assumption that you're going to walk in and, and, and ask a, a question that's not pre-screened and whatever. It's not going to happen. It's like uh, you, could, you could spend uh, all, all the time and effort in the world to uncover what's on J.P. Morgan's books or any large bank for that matter. And if they don't want you to find it, and this is not something they would want you to find, you're not going to find it. Go on to the next uh, point. I mean, it, it, you'd, you'd be banging your head against the wall if, you, if you're, you're sitting trying to uncover this. Very interesting. Books. Very interesting. Um, I want to ask you about uh, the retail investor. Retail demand is, is just not there. Uh, we're uh, coming to the end of August. Uh, gold bottom at 1180 in September 2018. It's up over uh, 30% since then. Uh, I called a number of large bullion dealers and uh, it's, it, they just tell me, look, that we are at 10% capacity of what we were in 2016. 10% capacity. This is incredible. You can see a surge of 1,000% in orders to return to the 2016 interest. But they are saying that there are concentrated smart money buyers taking up big um, uh, blocks of, of orders. I want to ask you, uh, do you think that there's trauma from the 2011, uh, 1900 to 1100 meltdown in, in gold prices? And I'll tell you why, um, my own, uh, uh, opinion on this. People thought that there was such a direct correlation between QE and low interest rates and the price of gold that nobody could foresee any downside 
and it, it was such a uh, such an incredible uh, meltdown that I think many people are wondering whether or not uh, gold prices can go beyond what these banks, um, you know, beyond the scope of what uh, the banks' uh, suppressions can, can be. What, what do you think about the retail uh, demand right now? What do you think about the retail mentality? Well, I think you've des- you described it right um, in that the, the retail demand is uh, is poor, uh, to say to say the least, and uh, um, and it is a direct uh, result of uh, the price. Until very recently, the price, you know, not going anywhere, um, going well, going down, not 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 that going only down. Um, this is just normal function. Uh, the, the price went down, I would maintain, because of manipulative uh, positioning on the COMEX. Okay, that's the root cause of the price going down. But the net result of the price going down in terms of retail demand that you, you, you brought up is that it's, that's very normal and natural. Uh, people collectively, investors in anything collectively, don't buy that investment, that asset, whatever it happens to be, real estate, stocks, bonds, unless it's going up in price. Uh, it's very rational. It, 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 it's, it's, what, it's how people behave. It's just, it's just collective human nature. So it's very natural that there's not, there hasn't been retail demand in gold or silver um, up until maybe it's starting to change a little bit now, but ha- hasn't been over the last eight years or so because the price has gone down. Why the price has gone down is a separate discussion. The price going down is a direct, has directly resulted in people not buying. But the, the good news is, if, if you're looking for what's going to transpire in the future, is that people will change their mind when the price changes and starts to go up. Now that we've started to go up, it's, we can look forward at some point, if it continues to go higher, as, as I think it will, maybe not on a straight line, but will, you'll get retail demand back, back to where it was and even greater uh, extent to where it's been in the past because we have more buying power in the world today than we ever had in the history of the world. So the next time when at some point Prices going up will trigger, will ignite retail demand. The, the, one other good piece of good news is that retail demand generally doesn't have anything to do with the price. It's a, price is not generally driven by retail demand. Certainly, we can look back over the last few months and see that gold has gone up say more than $300 an ounce, and you're bringing up the valid point that there's been no retail demand, uh, and I'm agreeing, and that just goes to show you, you don't need retail demand to drive the price. You need other things. In the case of gold and silver, you need this special positioning on the COMEX mainly. That's the main price driver. That's taking place right now. Um, The real question at this point is, Will the big short positions on the COMEX, which have not buckled in at all, okay, and have continued to grow, will that short position, you know, come under such pressure, uh, financial pressure, because they're losing more money, the shorts are losing more money than they've ever lost in history as we speak, uh, making them desperate. Uh, either to drop the price down as best as best they can, try as hard as they can to drop the price down, okay, to get some relief, because if you're short and the price is going up, you're losing. If you're short and the price is going down, then you're winning. But these guys made, since there's so few of them, there's only seven, eight, ten of them, okay, that are big shorts in COMEX, gold and silver, that if they have miscalculated, and uh, there's much more buying to come from big players around the world, not retail people, they'll come in later, but big players out there in the world might, okay, sense that these big shorts on the COMEX are in trouble and might not be able to continue to add short positions and even 
might have to buy back their existing short positions, then all hell can break loose on the upside. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm saying either of these big shorts are going to knock the price down, okay, as they always have in the past, or for the very first time, as my late friend Izzy Friedman always predicted, they're going to get caught with the full pants down. They're going to get caught with such a big short position that they can't fund it anymore and they can't add shorts and they're going to get overridden to the upside and turn around and panic and buy back their short position and then you'll want to stand back because prices, particularly for silver, will go straight up. Do you think in that kind of uh, situation the price goes to uh, 25 an ounce or is, does it go to 50 an ounce and, and beyond? I mean, uh, silver is, uh, to my uh, understanding, it is the only one of the uh, 30 major commodities that has not surpassed its all-time highs from uh, 1980. All the other ones are trading at uh, prices that are well above uh, whatever they traded for 40 years ago or 39 years ago. Silver is the only one that is so far removed from its all-time high and it hasn't had an all-time high in 39 years. Um, because obviously the price of uh, mining silver is uh, is on average about 14 or $15 uh, an ounce. From what we know, obviously there's many uh, private minings, uh, especially in in China that we don't know, we don't know the price of uh, uh, the cost of mining, but how much of a premium over the mining uh, cost do you think that silver uh, can trade for? Uh, all these outside factors, which you normally come to mind, like the cost of mining and, you know, uh, and consumption and things like that, you got to take all that stuff and throw it out the window. Because if we get into, a short covering panic, which is a, a distinct possibility. It's one or the other. Either the shorts are going to win and knock this price down one more time, or they're going to panic, okay, and start to buy back. Take any number that you that you have in your mind and throw it out the window. Uh, you, you, there's no logical way of predicting how high something might go in a true short covering panic. We've never had that in silver. The shorts have always prevailed. That's your, you're, you're pointing out and rightly so that silver is the cheapest thing around and everything else has made new highs and silver is not the, is the only one that hasn't made new highs. I'm giving you the reason why silver has not made new highs. It's because the shorts have remained intact. They have stood there and fought and capped the price and kept the price down. I'm turning around and saying these guys are now under financial pressure, more in gold than in silver, ironically, because silver hasn't gone up that much. But the short position in, in silver is so large that if it starts to go up, and if it starts to jump by dollars per ounce, which it hasn't done of yet, then the big losses to these shorts are gonna be in silver. And when they go to panic, if, if they go to panic and, and buy back their short positions, okay, you just can't pick a reasonable, logical number. Logic and reason have nothing to do with anything in a full-blown short covering panic. That's extremely interesting. Um, and we've seen uh, all sorts of uh, manias up there um, with silver specifically. Uh, back in, in the late uh, 70s. And, and even in, in 2011, I remember the price was uh, around 31 an ounce. And I was looking at it, uh, you know, I'm talking, I was looking at it by the minute. I was trading it. And I said, if, if, uh, if it's not going down right now from 31, it's going to spike right up to about 42. And sure enough, went all the way to about 48 at the, uh, at the peak. I want to ask about the, uh, the gold and silver ratio. Is this out of whack or is this the new norm? Uh, of course it's out of whack. The, 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 the new, the, it was never this high you know, for, for any period of time over the last 5,000 years. It's like uh, 
it, it, it's just another indicator, okay, another objective measurement that silver is priced way too cheaply. It's like, uh, it, 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 it's not so much that people are trading gold versus silver or there's any logical or meaningful um, uh, reason why uh, the price of silver is where it is. It's just ma more manipulated than gold. It's the most manipulated commodity in the world, and manipulated to the downside. And it, and it goes back to how long is this thing going to be manipulated? There are signs now that the manipulation might be broken. I, I can't guarantee it. I'm not telling you that for sure that we're going to be facing a, a, an imminent uh, short covering panic in, in, in silver in the, in the very near future. We could be, but I, no one knows if that's going to be the case or not. But it's either going to be that or it's going to be the short stay in control. And then if the manipulation is broken, if the shorts go to panic, okay, and they can't, uh, maybe the government tells them privately, look, stop shorting this thing. You're, it's becoming obvious. You're, you're, you're depressing the price by yourself, and that's a pure manipulation. Government should have done it a long time ago. Well, if, the, if that occurs, big if, if these shorts, okay, are no longer allowed, either because they can't afford it or they're ordered to or whatever, they just get overrun, um, everything is going to change overnight. I mean, we're going to look back and see that, of course, the, the gold silver ratio never should have been as high as it is, and it'll collapse, and, and, and that silver will, will zoom up in price. Okay, but the reason is going to be because of whether we have short covering or not. Whether these, uh, I, I don't mean to make uh, the things so myopic that it's um, that it's all you know depends upon what these shorts do. But that's the way it is. It's it's like it, there's nothing else that makes sense. You can't go out and tell me that uh, well we we had too much silver mining or we haven't had too much silver consumption or it, we haven't had enough retail buyers buy it. it that, well, take all that stuff like out the window. It doesn't matter one whit. What matters is what these big crooked shorts on the Comex do or don't do. Uh, that's going to determine the price. And uh, there are signs that uh, these guys are under pressure. Um, whether they succumb to that pressure or not, no one knows. We'll only know that in the fullness of time. But, but if it occurs, it's going to be bing, bang, boom. It's not going to be some long, drawn-out thing. We're going to go from it's going to be a black or a white situation. Um, We'll see. It's, uh, that, that's what the, the data in the uh, Commitment of Traders report uh, shows. This is all based on government data, U.S. government data, that shows the size of the concentrated short position. And we know from the price action so far that these guys are under pressure. They're losing you know, many billions, four or five billion dollars as we speak. They've never lost quite this much before it's not realized losses it's open okay unrealized losses um they're either going to succeed and knock this thing down again or they're going to fail in which case we're just gonna i, I, I can't give you a, 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 any kind of a logical price it's going to be at what price these guys are done panicking when they buy back their positions they haven't started yet I mean, it's not, there's no indication that they've started to buy, buy back any of their short positions. But uh, if and if, as and when they do buy back these uh, short positions, it's going to be instantly recognizable in the price. We won't be moving by 10, 20, 30 cents a day in silver. We'll be moving by dollars. And that'll be your first tip off that the, uh, the manipulation has broken. If we start jumping dollars per day, um, it's not guaranteed that's going to happen, but it's a it's a distinct possibility. In fact, it's one or the other. Either it's the the, the, the shorts are going to succeed and manipulate the prices down again, or they're going to fail and we're going to explode in price. I, I don't see anything in between.
between. Ted, who's who's large enough to uh, to squeeze them? Which entities uh, or which entities or which banks, which funds can go long silver and, and squeeze these people out? A list, a list as long as your arm. It's not the pr- the problem is not with the buyers. We got more money in the world, okay, chasing crazy things. Uh, that uh, a small fraction of that coming into the to the metals. It's just the market in general, buyers in general. If these if these buyers who have bought so far, a lot of them are these technical funds. We call them managed managed money traders. They're technically oriented. They're well ahead right now. They got open profits, but they have this uh, nasty habit that when prices drop sufficiently after they bought, okay, they'll turn around and sell. They just follow the prices, follow moving averages, follow the charts. Um, up until now, the shorts have, have, have prevailed. Uh, they know these guys are going to sell at some point, so they load up on the short side, waiting for the day that these guys, these technical funds, are, will sell at lower prices. But something can happen in the meantime. For instance, for instance, over the last two months or so, there's been 100 million ounces, physical ounces, 100 million physical ounces, a billion and a half dollars worth that have come into the silver ETFs, SLD, SIPR, the Deutsche Bank uh, silver ETF, and a couple of others. That is the most silver that's ever been come physical silver that's ever been bought, okay, in such a short period of time in history. We've never had this kind of buildup in physical silver. Um, it's not little guys, as you point out, the, the, the retail people aren't buying this. They didn't go out and buy 100 million ounces, a billion and a half dollars of this physical silver in these ETFs over the last couple of months. Um, It's somebody big. There's lots of big people in the world. It's a a billion and a half dollars, okay, is not that much money. 100 million ounces of silver is a hell of a lot of silver, okay? And the point is there's lots more money out there that could and should try to find its way into silver. And if it does it now, if, if we, we've ticked up in price or if the, the juices start flowing and people start to buy silver, then these big shorts, okay, are in real trouble. And that will eventually cause them to, to give up the ghost and, and try and buy back their short positions and, and save what's left of their skin okay, while they can, and that in turn will feed on prices going up. Again, I can't tell you this is for sure going to happen. It, it might be underway. We might have started it. Or it could turn out that these short crooks, because there's no legitimate reason to be short silver. We've already established it's the cheapest thing around. Who in their right mind shorts, okay, the cheapest thing around. That's not, you want to you want to buy low and sell high. If you're shorting, you want to wait for a high price to short. You don't want to short at a low price. These guys shorted at a low price and now they're eager to protect their short position by selling more, but they can do that up to a certain point and boom, once they hit the limit, okay, of what they can afford or uh, other people coming up from the long side, it, it's game over, and we may be at that point. Uh, we may be at that point. It's the signs of it. Ted, do you think it's, uh, does it strike you as bizarre that people have no, general people have no idea the importance that gold and silver have played in the past 5,000 years in, in Europe and, uh, you know, in, in uh, North America and around, in China, around the world? Uh, in, in trade and just in the everyday life. Uh, when you ask a person about gold, he thinks it's jewelry. I, I don't even know what he thinks about silver, but he has no idea how Im- instrumental they were for uh, every empire that has ever existed in terms of uh, trade and commerce. Uh, how important is that uh, with, with uh, uh, the story of gold and silver? Well, I, I, I don't want to be sound disrespectful of my uh, fellow man, but I, I don't think you're describing anything particularly unique and unusual to gold and silver. I, I don't think 
most people know a lot about most things. It's uh, it, it's like we're in everybody's in their own little world, and uh, things that matter to you uh, don't matter to someone else. And, and this is uh, this is not an, an, an earth um, you know earth shaking of earth shaking importance to. Uh, uh, to the guy in the street, um, um, silver and gold and its history and stuff like that, unless you, you know, you sit down and you take an interest in it for whatever reason. So I wouldn't hold that against uh, people. People don't know much about most anything. There's just too many things to know. Uh, we, we're living in such a complex world that, uh, you know, it's not reasonable to, um, expect people to be experts in, in, in things that don't really matter to them too much. Look, if they see the price go, the price goes up for whatever reason, short covering, you know, whatever reason, investment demand, whatever. Um, when it goes up sufficiently, people will jump on board. That's just that's just collective human nature. Uh, when the price goes down, people don't buy it. When the price goes up, they buy it. And we haven't been going. We just started to go up a little bit in, uh, in, in, in gold, and particularly only a very little bit in silver. So it's not, uh, I guess, uh, reasonable to expect uh, that people would be rushing in right now. But let the price go higher, okay? Higher still and continue higher over time. And I'm sure you'll see a... Uh, a rush of uh, retail demand, the new interest in uh, in silver and gold. It, it's just the way it is. It's just it's just human nature. So, retail demand does not drive the price. It's uh, institutional demand and demand on the COMEX and uh, demand in the in the silver ETFs that will drive the price. And uh, that seems to be you know beginning to occur, and it's uh, very encouraging. Ted, I want to ask you, where can people check out more of your research, more of your work? Uh, where should people go? Uh, go to Google and uh, type in butlerresearch.com, and that will bring you uh, to the website. If you do a bigger search on Google, you'll find uh, you know, plenty of articles. But I think there's, if I'm not mistaken, there's uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of, uh, of articles that people can read for free at uh, at butlerresearch.com. Ted, thank you very much for jumping on this call today and we'll definitely uh, circle back. Look forward to it, thanks a lot. Thank you, Ted. Okay.